kind of became a bit of a hunter of it. But the, the, the joy of it is it's really hard to predict when it's going to happen. Um, and I mean fireflies, which I have not seen since I was in Virginia like a decade ago. Um, fireflies, ghost mushrooms I've been looking for lately. And, um, and of course, the incredible massive waves they've been having in California lately with this red tides that, that glow neon. Like it's a uh, part of the magic is yeah, that you don't, you don't know when, and when you come across it, it's like you're, you're in an enchanted world. I just love it. Yeah. Yeah. And you talk, um, so awe and wonder, which all of these things um, certainly elicit by the sound of it um, are two of the central feelings that you explore in your work and um, your focus is definitely on their benefits um, to us emotionally, spiritually, and also physically. Um, I love what you did um, with ensuring that you backed up all of these claims with lots and lots of evidence. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about your decision to write the book in this way with personal experiences intermingling with um, interviews and scientific studies that you reference. Mm. It was just almost like a natural way to write. I never like made a decision like that's what I was going to do. I was Some of it was coming from personal experience or observation or stories or instincts. So, and so I would write about swimming, right? And why ocean swimming like has been such an amazing thing for me and been really restorative and meditative and beautiful, but it's something, I felt like it was giving me something other than daily exercise, right? Uh, other than forcing me out of bed and getting me um, into the water with a whole bunch of people who are just basically really cheerful to be there actually, that you have almost nothing in common with apart from the fact that you love the water and you can talk about tides and jellyfish and all that kind of thing for a very long time. But I felt like um, aside from all of those really obvious benefits, there was something else that it was giving me that was sustaining me um, in a way I couldn't really quite fathom or understand. And I started to think about the concept of awe and so awe being when you're taken, you know, you're taken, so they, it's often used interspersed with wonder. Wonder when you really wonder about something, you, you know, from kids wondering about little stars to just stopping and going, how does that work? And something that's kind of, weirdly enough, I did get stuck in thinking about what the difference was between the two of them a lot, but awe really stops you in your tracks. And scientists now try to measure it in goosebumps. So, um, when, when I started to think about it, I just dug into it and I was just looking through all the social science and, and I've, I, I worked out that there was a whole like, group of people, scientists in a scientific way, trying to measure this thing which seems immeasurable. And so to get all they like will have groups of people standing underneath enormous Californian redwoods or, or they'd place a group next to um, enormous dinosaur skeletons and see actually how big they signed their names afterwards and it'd be smaller after they'd been next to something huge and um, they'd see if they would help, more likely to help someone after they'd experienced awe and they had. So it was all these findings around altruism and lack of ego and that I really became convinced about a need for smallness. So I guess it was where poetry met science, which is a happy place for me. Yeah. That's lovely. It's true. That is a good, that is a very nice place to be in yeah. when it sort of has this, yeah, this wonderful, um, this wonderful connection. And again, connection is obviously something that um, you reference a lot here between um, ourselves and in nature. And that kind of leads nicely into my next question, actually, because I wanted to talk about, as you mentioned, um, you love swimming and you rely on swimming a lot to, to ground and sustain you. Um, and I wanted you to talk a bit about the benefits of bathing in the ocean and also that practice of bathing in nature, which I found absolutely fascinating to read about. Yeah. Um, so that is one thing that I was kind of quite taken aback by. If I talk about the science, how much science there was around green things and how important it is. And again, there's this whole movement, this forest therapy movement, um, uh, um, which, which is spreading globally, which kind of began in Japan. And I did go to Tokyo and met the guy who kind of came up with the, the theory about it. And it being the more urbanised we get, the more we kind of have an ache for something that we sometimes can't even necessarily identify. Um, but it is the sight of green. And they now do have guides who will take people through like woods or forests and get them to go really slowly and kind of soak it in and like... Um, soak it up like the, the thought that we would need people to guide us to do that on one hand is kind of strange to anyone who, who does that instinctively um but i really understood um after a while and after looking at all the studies around it why it was that people people do it and 
the um, Ching Lee, the, the um, professor in Tokyo, said to me that he thought that it was something to do with the smell of trees, actually. Um, it was a lot to do with peptides. But they have, they have conducted so many studies into young and old, um, all people in all walks of life, just to see what it means to them to be exposed to green and to be exposed to nature. And they measured their saliva and their heart rate and their mood and their mental health and physical health and all these different kinds of things. And it just improves at every measure there is. And the studies are getting bigger and bigger. So, but if we go back to the poetry sense of it, I mean, it's just, it's just putting words to what we all know, right? That when you see green or you see blue or you're just out in the natural world, um, something about it meditates you. Yeah, yeah, and calms you, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move on to talking a bit about um, documenting moments, um, particularly those moments um, that bring us that awe and wonder, um, and the smaller moments in history that are both personal and um, political. So can you talk about a bit about why documenting moments is um, an archiving, I think, as you refer to it in the book, is, is important for us to sustain us? Oh, right. Yeah, well, I started writing that chapter because I was trying to work out why I had kept so many boxes of this period of activism in my life. Why was I holding on to that? Maybe partly as a historian, I find it hard to let some of those things go. And I started out as a, writing an honours thesis, thesis in this area. And so I kept all these, all these kind of scraps and shrapnel. And it was a period of time where I really cared about something and not much got actually done. <laughs> Um, like, and so I, I wondered whether the more I thought about it, I just wondered, um, whether in a way it, we need to honor the times in our lives where we strive and where we care. And we've all been involved in futile things, right? We've all wondered why it is that something we really want to change hasn't changed no matter what we do. And I kind of wanted to honor the people who do things in those liminal years, which aren't the big years of breakthrough, like the suffragettes or the 1970s, but the plotting years in between and many of us have been in those whether you, like you care about the environment or whether you're at your local school or whatever it is so but as a because um, I am a historian as well I've thought a lot about archives and I've spent a lot of time in archives and the archives are preserved we preserve them because we think that story is important to tell and they're important people or they're powerful people and so people pay a lot of money to keep archives over a long period of time and to preserve them and make sure they don't get too yellowed and faded or eaten up by silverfish and i thought that, you know a lot of women traditionally don't like um they've a lot of women have quilted and um sewn or made placards or done things that it's seen as more temporal and so I think I also wanted to say that it's important to, you know, document some of those, those struggles as well. It's yeah, important. yeah. And that's what I particularly loved about this part of the book is that recognising those smaller events that have this ripple effect that even though they may not be the main event as yeah. such, they absolutely have enabled the main event to take place. There's no doubt about right. that. So would you mind reading to us from this part? Sure. So if you, um, it's page 102. Yeah. Yeah, would you mind reading this bit to us? Yeah, sure thing. I mean, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> no. Okay. Which brings me back to archives. Why do we even preserve archives, the stuffed boxes in our attics that tell our own stories, as well as those in distinguished libraries that preserve the documents of influential figures, like Queen Victoria that I looked at? And where is the line between hoarding and preservation? What it is crucial to understand is that to keep records is to insist on significance. By doing so, you place something on record and you assert that it is of note. You are saying that it is something people should remember, that they may want to find out about at some point. If it is marked down, they'll be able to do that. Women have not historically kept records. They've quilted and stitched. They've scrapbooked, pasted in remnants, sewn fables, passed stories down through generations, while men have filed official documents. And through these documents, men have dictated the past and determined who we see as winners and losers. This is how power begets power. As Joan Schwartz, archival specialist, professor of art history at Queen's University, Canada wrote, through archives, the past is controlled. Certain stories are privileged and others marginalized. And archivists are an integral part of this storytelling. 
And by the way, like the more you go into an archive, like the more, the, 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 the more frightening the archivist librarian is. Like once you go to the really, really important ones that involve like, you know, your passport and letters of permission and armed guards and being accompanied to the toilet like I was at the um, Royal Archives, that's when you maybe seriously intimidating. In the record keeping systems, record keeping systems, in the appraisal and selection of a tiny fragment of all possible records to enter the archive, in approaches to subsequent and ever changing descriptions and preservation of the archive, and in its patterns of communication and use, archivists continually reshape, reinterpret and reinvent the archive and also hide things sometimes, unfortunately. This represents enormous power over memory and identity over the fundamental ways in which society seeks evidence of what its core values are and have been, where it has come from and where it is going. Archives then are not passive storehouses of old stuff, but active sites where social power is negotiated, contested, confirmed. Historically, archives have excluded the stories of women, of people of colour, of the LGBTQI communities, of those inhabiting peripheries. The records of their lives have been discarded or lost, while those of small groups of powerful men have been carefully polished, even the smallest fragments collected and kept. Now the rest of us need to insist our stories matter. Today, thanks to but we must also keep records for us, not just the stories of true lives and the long grinding nature of reform, the bitter, often boring struggle for freedom. For me, the piles of documents and memoranda in an archivist's attic are stories of perseverance. So if you have leaned your weight against something disturbing or unjust and it apparently remained unchanged, remember this, weight is cumulative. Rebecca Solnit is correct when she argues that every protest shifts the world's balance and urges us to remember the countless acts of resistance on all scales that were never recorded. To reinforce this idea, she employs the metaphor of the mushroom. The mushrooms that spring up after rain are only the fruiting body of a far larger underground fungus we do not see. The rain causes the mushrooms to rise out of the earth, but the fungus was alive and well and invisible beforehand. The rain can be an event. I love that. Did you want me to... Is that it? No, that's great. That's great. Thank you. I think that's that's particularly um, again. I've already commented, and I'm sure I'm sure that you have. I've I've definitely seen um, people's reviews saying, "Oh, this this couldn't have come out at a more you know a more necessary time." Um, and it's certainly true. And particularly now when we're finding that we all or a lot of us are looking back at history and looking at those small things and hang, and like using them at the moment to really ground and and sustain us. Right. So. But while we're doing that, we're also, and, and this is a very closely linked um, part in the chapter, we're also being confronted um, really quite, um, well, very much with um, the idea of impermanence at the moment. And I think that's quite um, a difficult thing to deal with. But in your book, you talk about how impermanence can also relate very well to wonder and awe. And I'm wondering if you can um, tell the audience a bit about the significance of this and then read for us again, if you wouldn't mind about yeah, impermanence. Yeah. Um, so the, the idea of impermanence, and again, this is, this is an interesting chapter actually, because I, I wrote a lot about this and then I couldn't quite work out what it is I was trying to say until the very, very end. And part of it, I was writing about street art and I love street art and um, I've got a Roan, that's a Roan picture that's, right that's there. That's the thing that I've asked you to read, actually. If you oh, oh, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, get ahead of it. Oh, is it on um, 109? Uh, towards the bottom of, of, um, of 102. Oh, sorry, of 109, yes, at the bottom of 109. It says street artists? Yes. <laughs> so we, so street artists understand the beauty of ephemera because they trade in it. For most of us, the prospect of labouring intensely on murals while perched on ladders, cranes and cherry pickers for weeks, only to see them subsequently tagged with graffiti or smashed to ruins is a sobering one. But for street artists, it's like a singular thrill. Temporary in a game, which on one level is shocking. On another, their attitude resembles the Buddhist view of attachment, which asserts that clinging to objects, people or places will only create more suffering for ourselves. Buddha taught that all conditioned things, anything that depends on certain conditions for its existence, and that's objects, 
thoughts or atoms are impermanent by nature arising and passing away. If they arise, he said, and are extinguished, their eradication brings true happiness. The universal law then is that impermanence governs all things. This in some ways echoes the Bible, which repeatedly teaches that attachment to material things, to things of the world is a distraction for all must perish. So street artists practice detachment in a way that can be difficult for an archive hungry historian like me to fathom. I spent many years searching for these fragments of evidence, yellowing letters and water stained documents in an attempt to understand the past, seeking above all preservation. And then I talk about, about, about meeting Roan and going into like his incredible, like I, it was the star lyric. He's done other um, places and houses since. He has incredible installations, absolutely beautiful. And M Melburnians will, will know. Um, all about his work and then it just gets ripped down it's just he goes into abandoned buildings and um that kind of <laughs> that whole concept but it's kind of part of what he loves creating something and i realized i think right towards the very end um when i, I kind of say if we are conscious of the temporariness of anything or everything we're far less likely to squander time looking backwards or forwards or to moments other than the one we're in. So if we accept flowering is by its nature a fleeting occurrence, like those cacti that, you know, like flower once every hundred years, then we're more likely to recognize each bid as a victory and each blossom as a triumph. And if we accept impermanence, we're far more likely to live in the present, to relish the beauty in front of us and the almost infinite possibilities contained in every hour or a single breath. Mm. Yeah, I think it's beautiful and again just completely um, relates to another feeling that we're all very familiar with now, that idea that we are I think reflecting on the lives that we used to live and, and really appreciating things that we all took for granted for a very long time. Right. Um, yeah, I and I love how you link it to, um, to your son's um, your son's favorite pair of underwear. I think that's about this. There are certain things that you can, that should be held onto the memories of that, but not the actual objects all the time. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. No, he, he had this massive, I just discovered one day that he had just had so many underpants left. He was just doing a throw out. Um, now he's, he would have been about, I mean, he's 11 now, so it would have been about 10 and there were like four year old underpants in there. And I was like, dude, we've got to clean his out. And he was like, oh, you can't, mum, there's so many memories in his underpants. I was like, all right. But yeah. Like, what do you mean? I was like, and I lifted up a pair and he's like, I was like, what's the memory of this one? And he was like, oh, that was the time we went to the water. It's so great. And his sister, like, yeah, it really was actually. I was like, all right, fine. Underpant memories. <laughs> so it's a whole Marie Kondo thing is that some things can trigger a memory yeah. of joy. Right? Um, so I would love to um, get questions from the audience in a minute. I'm going to ask Julia one more question. But yeah, please, if you haven't yet sent um, Chrissy your queries, then please do now for Julia. Um, but yeah, Julia, I wanted to ask, I've already mentioned how much I love um, the scientific and psychological facts that you reference in the book. And, and I'm wondering, you, you've touched on your research process and obviously with a, a PhD in, in history, you're, you're very familiar with research by now. But um, I'm wondering when you came to researching the book and writing the book, which aspects did you, what, what was left out that you would like to sort of, what material didn't make the cut? Is there any of it that... You wish to make the cut. Well, do you know what? Once you start to do it, like you just go down another wormhole, another, like it, I could, could have kept going. Um, my publisher will tell you towards the end, I was like, wait, I've just found out about the overview effect, which is what happens to astronauts psychologically when they go into space and they come back like poetic and philosophical and, you know, like not so, you know, straight up engineer scientists anymore. Um, that was a, a last minute revelation and it was all about how transformed that form they were by I think realizing how small we are, how the earth can just be appear behind their thumb, um, all that stuff. So it was a lot of, look, I'm just writing things down every day. I still think there's so much to explore in the concepts of awe and wonder, also grace, just kind of that magical stuff. Yeah. It seems to be at odds with some of the mathematical principles of the universe. You know, you push, you push back um, something that, I don't know, underwrites it and almost can't be explained. Yeah. Undermines it, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I might um, I might go to Chrissy now. Chrissy, have we got any questions? We've got a couple of questions here already. Oh, okay. So 
One of them is um, from Suzanne, who says, um, Julia, how do you keep going without letting past failures, in inverted commas, overpower you, both personal and professional? Yeah, right. Um, that's the question of, like, I guess you just have to accept that you're human, like, then that we're all really just got a whole bunch of failures in our lives. I don't know why I'm kind of tend to be um, kind of gentler on myself about that kind of thing now. Um, maybe you hope that it will be better around the corner. Maybe um, if you've got enough, you know, love in your life, you can't really feel that you're fundamentally, fundamentally failing because there's always something around something else around the corner. Um, I don't know. I think, I think I just accept that I make mistakes every day and, um, and yeah. And the older I get, the more kind of at peace I am with that. So I try not to beat myself up about, about stuff I could have done, I think, because there's so much remaining to do. There's so, you know, when there's time to get things right, that was the best thing of all. Like it would be so hard to have like, not very much time left and have like a whole bunch of things that you wished you'd done or said or been, you know? Yeah. Fair enough. There's also a question here, um, uh, which starts, Julia, did you know that the world would be so dark, but seriously, how long did um, this book take you to write? It feels like it was years in the making. Yeah, probably. Well, I mean, there's been bits and I mean, I pulled things of that over notebooks that I've been working on like quite some time ago. Um, years ago I mean I spoke at the beginning about like 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 heartbreak I had several years ago when um a counsellor said to me um I was like I just don't know how I'm going to get through all of this right I just have no idea how I'm going to get through this and he was like it is now that everything in your life matters right every book you've ever read every poem every song you've ever sung every beautiful moment every member of your family every friend everything that's that's when this mat that matters. It's now. And the idea that you could somehow have kind of a reservoir that you could draw on as opposed to suddenly, you know, crap hitting the fan and then going, oh, now I need to find some wisdom. You've probably, you've accumulated so much stuff in your life that you can, that you can draw on. So, um, wait, now I've forgotten the question again. Did you know the world could be so dark? And yes, it would take a while. Yes, yeah, so I, I wrote it in bits and pieces and fits and bursts. So, but pulling together things that, yeah, I had been thinking about for some time, but probably in earnest for the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and related to that, is there a particular um, thing that you learned on your journey to write this book um, that uh, has stuck with you since? It's all written down, really. All the. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think um, I, I mean, I think it is a bit of that, about that nexus between poetry and science that I was talking about. And I also think that it's very liberating to write very truthfully about yourself. Like, it's just very liberating to not have to be anything else. Um, and, you know, to reach a point where you just, you know, you're pretty comfortable with your warts and all and this is just you know, what happened in the way I think. And also, you know, like you don't have to go through a serious trauma or illness illness to work out that you're vulnerable and that you're fragile and that we all are and that we're all connected by that. But it sure is a pretty decent reminder of that. And um, the idea that Nick Cave talks about, you know, that we're all connected by suffering and, and that we have our, um, that our purpose in life is to try to actively reduce each other's suffering. I think that really has stayed with me. And, and a lot of the correspondence I've had from people, I've just had so many beautiful emails and letters and things um, from people just telling me about this kind of yearning for things of awe or the need to remind themselves of that kind of beauty um, or yearning for something else or yearning for ways to talk about this kind of stuff. I've been really struck by too. Um, and I think that's part of a way that you can ease one another's suffering as well, the sense of like loneliness or strangeness in the world. Right. Um, so uh, Elizabeth has said that, thank you for your poignant, honest and life-affirming words um, and for Victoria, which is a delight. Um, but how do your children feel about you referring to them in your writing? <laughs> One of 
them just came in here. They're so uninterested, I can't tell you. Um, they, oh, how do they feel about it? Um, I think they're okay about the stories. Like I'll run the stories by them just to see if they're any, um, you know, if there's any awkward or embarrassing moments. The underpants thing I did have to say to Sam, I've written about you talking about underpants and then we had to work around that. Um, but I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty careful not to do anything that would, you know, compromise them or anything. And, um, but, but yeah, I, I can't really, neither of them have read it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, and my daughter, I had to force her to sit down and read my letter to her only just before it was about to be published. I'm like, you've just got to, just in case, <laughs> I don't think someone else sees it or, and she was like, yeah, okay. And then it was, I was fine. That was all. So um, she's, you know, 13 years old. She's not going to do anything I say right now at the moment. So um, they're, they're happy that I get to write because it's what makes me happy, I think. I love it. Um, so there's a question here about um, religion and the church. How do you feel about um, the religion and the church, particularly with um, all the kind of, you know, scandals and the treatment of women and, and that sort of stuff that has, you know... Yeah. Yeah, well, that is something that I write about in the book and it's something I've, you know, things that I've, I've spoken about this publicly for a while because I do live in a, I did grow up once I was back from the States as a kid, I did grow up in the Anglican Diocese of Sydney where women are not allowed to um, be priests and now it's actually got worse. They're not allowed to preach if there's a man above puberty in the congregation and stuff. Um, so... I have a very, I, I, I think that's complete madness um, on just so many levels and will doom the church to a kind of irrelevance um, if they continue to relegate women to, you know, to be silent. Um, I, but beyond that, the church is different. I've, I've always struggled with the institutional church because I think they've, um, they've, you know, sidelined women, it's become very clerical, it's become very, we've seen it in all the scandals recently about very too concerned with reputation and with moral questions and with preservation of power. And in my view, it should be the complete opposite. It should be just about rolling your sleeves up and getting on with loving people. And um, I do write in the book about, um, you know, that I think that the church should really, the leaders should really um, stop stop preaching and stop being part of politics in the sense of just what people need is the kind of things that Helen Garner wrote about with, with Tim Winton, right? The, the important things, the important if you're a person of, of faith or if you're, is to let your life be a witness and you just want, if you're working out how to love people better, to just kind of demonstrate that because for many, many entirely understandable reasons, there's an entire generation that has watched... Um, has watched, has been deeply disappointed and at times enraged with the institutional church. But um, there are very many very beautiful people of faith who trot about their lives just trying to be decent people. And I kind of want to honour them as well. Like my mum is one of them as well. So, yeah. That's a great answer. I have many thoughts on that. Many, many thoughts Another on the institutional church. And um, But I think faith is very separate. I really do. And I I think women have had to always had to work that out because blokes have been running the show um, and not reflecting their own experience. So, yeah. Um, there's also a question here from um, Shay who asks uh, about whether you felt that you brushed up against the sublime in your search for um, awe and wonder. The sublime. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit. So, did I brush up against the sublime yes I think that was the question it was um did you feel that you brushed up against the sublime during your time writing the book was that it Chrissy sorry because you did it. cut out a yeah. tiny bit is it? yeah um that makes me want to like uh, do you know what my instinct is to go uh, science sublime study um yeah yeah I think I think awe and wonder are about the sublime um and the things that you cannot, like a, a, a mystery and things that you cannot put words to, um, which I tried hard to in many of these parts. I do. Um, but, you know, giving birth is, is brushing up against the sublime as well. 
in a very painful way. But um, I think I think I think awe and wonder and a questioning and a feeling small and realizing that there's kind of an unfathomable magic in things around us, in not just the world, but in in um, in inexplicable acts of kindness or great moments of grace all those kinds of things I think I found them to be and um, they really made me very happy like really I really like the more you fill your mind with that kind of stuff and those kinds of acts and um yeah, I don't know the better life is I really do it was just such a great it was such a great pleasure writing this book and when I was finishing it it was really I was really unwell I was just like it was in a lot of pain and just the point of just getting to spend an hour or two a day in this place to think about all those things of beauty was just such a happy thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, a little moment of stillness amidst the chaos. Yeah, that's a wonderful design line. Um, Jen has asked, um, you mentioned before about um, the idea that as you get older, you care less about those other things that distract you from what's important. How do you think older people um, can help younger people through those anxieties that come with youth? Did you hear that? I did. And I just stopped and was like, well, I mean, you know, that's what I'm trying to do as a mother right now. You know, like, and that's part of why I wrote letters to each of my children, which are, which, which are part of the book as well. Um, how do we help them with their anxieties around not worrying about all those kinds of things? I mean, we're up against so much, you know, I mean, it's not like it's irrational. Some of the stuff is structural. They're dealing with an earth that's been on fire, um, let alone dealing with a pandemic Um, and climate change and all those kinds of things. You know, like, um, you know what? I mean, I think aside from a lot of the stuff that I go on about and my daughter will say, I really try hard not to give her many little mini lectures all the time about like accepting imperfection and accepting yourself and being a really great friend. And like friendship is such a big thing, such a big thing to tell people about, um, to get, to get right in the sense that you really, you call, you, you collect beautiful people as in, if they come into your life, it's not in a cynical way, they come into your life, you look after them, you, you know, if barnacles form on your friendship, you scrub them off, you care for them. We've got such a short time. Sometimes we have shorter with than we think with some of our friends and um, we're kind of really here to care for each other. So I think if they have those connections, that sustains them through so much. Um, it's hard to tell them how to, you know, accept themselves through the whole barrage of rubbish on social media, but um, that's a fight a lot of people are waging. But I also think there can be a lot of comfort in history. like. People have overcome the most horrendous and brutal and horrific times and actions in history. I mean, the Second World War is how I got interested in history. And you can see through that, like, I mean, the horror, I mean, it's just absolutely sheer horror, but you can also see people triumph. You can see people move through it, through most of our, you know, like the depression and um, and the world wars. There have been this incredible, like, social welfare and safety nets put in place and huge programs to kind of, um, so we can care, we can care for each other more. I, so I think it's really, really important to remember we are not the first generation to have dealt with a lot of this, even building global coalitions over seemingly intractable problems. It's all possible, you know? Um, That's a fantastic so. answer. It really is. I think um, uh, for me, I I remember um, discovering philosophy and going, oh, my goodness, all these terrible things that I've been questioning have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. I know, right? I know. And it's the same with feminism as well. Like the stuff that women were doing centuries ago and saying absolutely fiery, just stupendous women, um, we think we're reinventing it all, all the risque stuff, but no. No, that's true. But it's very comforting, I think. It is, isn't it? It's like, oh, I can't. Of course, I can't get it right. They haven't been able to get, able to get it right for hundreds. Of years. Yeah, that's right. But I'll keep going, as others have before me. You know. Um, there's a really great question here, actually, which is, um, can you overdose on awe? Um, can you get too much of it? Is there like an awe fatigue that you can have question. too much? I would love to be able to report that I'd even come close to something like awe fatigue. People can probably get adrenaline fatigues, fatigue. Um, I can't even 
answer that because I don't even know because I have no personal experience of having, having too much ball and I don't really know anyone else that has because everyone I know that has built that into their life and for me like that's what a lot of this book is about it's not just um, you know make sure you you know go to places of beauty or make sure you're up to see the sunrise occasionally or really pay attention to the world around you um, for me um, it's being deliberate about it, just being deliberate about building it into your day. It's not just all serendipitous. You can kind of make that part of your life. Um, so for a lot of the people that I spoke to most, that it was kind of, it was built into their life and sustain, sustaining them in a way. You never get sick of, you never get, who gets sick of a beautiful sunrise? Like, and that's what makes me laugh about my swim group. You just walk down and they're like, just like, mate, can you, can you believe it, mate? Look, you know, like, we get to live, we get to do this every day. They say it every single day. Like, every single day, someone will be standing there just going, unbelievable. We are just so lucky, you know. And it's true. And you're right. You're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, I think we can get, like, or cannot impact us because we might be dealing with other stuff or for mental or physical health reasons we can be detached from it. But once you're plugged into it, like, it's... It's like, it's not like an electrical socket, but it's just something that I just think would never, you, you just can't get, you can't get sick of it. I just really just cannot imagine getting sick of it. And people who, people, there's a small group of people in this field who write about awe. And I contacted some of them saying, what do you do? Like, how have you changed your, your life? And they're like, well, I'm now an awe junkie. I'm like, I've always, or some of them have always been, you know, and they just, go for it so no if anyone knows anyone that's had too much like too many goosebumps and too much awe i'd be interested to hear from them <laughs> there's a question here um swimming in the dark ocean is frightening to me says joe yeah. um i find awe is simply seeing how the worms in my worm farm turn scraps into soil what yeah. other awesome experiences do you think that we can have without having to leave home which yeah, is yeah that's a good question by the way i mean the, you know the great thing about bioluminescence, by the way? I mean, I totally agree that going into dark, a black sea and black sky, that is pretty freaky, and I wouldn't really do that a lot. But when I was down the south coast and saw it with my kids at the end of January, and we were kind of diving around the edge, and I was like, oh, and I was like, oh yeah, a shark will be lit up. Like, we would see an enormous, like, blue thing coming towards us, so we'd be safe, we would be safe on that level if we were swimming around. I love that you talk about the worm farms because that's exactly right. Some people responded to this book and were like, oh, well, we can't all go out and like chase storms in, you know, the middle of America or chase massive tornadoes or we can't all, we haven't all been able to ocean swim. It depends on where you live. But it's very much about honestly paying attention and um, to the things around you. And people have written to me about having just seen um, bees that just watched what they have do in their backyard um, just you know buzzing around one particular plant another woman about how she watched her kid just dive into some water and the, the drops did really interesting things um, you know gar gardens are infinite infinite sources as are skies as are kind of kids and people and some people have been you know like I think doing some pretty magical things in the kitchen um, that's another whole set of things but you know like like there's micro moments of awe. It doesn't um, have to be like abseiling down the Grand Canyon. There are things that can just make you go, man, that is kind of awesome. <laughs> like, um, I think it's about paying attention. Yeah. Right. Chrissy, which is, which is, um, who makes the mushrooms that you buy that come in a, a box? It's just a box oh, and yeah, the mushrooms grow from. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's giving you all at the moment. Yeah. Mushrooms are my thing, Julia. Mushrooms are oh. my thing. I loved your reading. I adore them. Oh, you love mu oh, mushrooms. What about ghost mushrooms? Have you seen them? No, and that was my plan, actually, was to go down for the season this, because um, we don't get them much in Queensland, and to go down to Victoria. And that was my plan. I was taking time off work, and I was going to go find, oh, go on a ghost hunt. Mushrooms. But um, no, I, I can't. But Ah, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, I've actually been looking out for them lately too. And they're there. I've found them a couple of times and then gone back the next day and they've been eaten or something. Something eats them that's in the wild. I don't know. So you've got to get to them pretty quickly. Oh. And um, I've also noticed those incredible, like, neon orange mushrooms I saw today. Wow, wow. They're amazing. They're oh, endlessly amazing. 
<laughs> I could talk to you about mushrooms forever, but there's so many questions. Yeah, great. I bet you could. Yeah. Get to a couple here. Um, uh, did you did you have any kind of particular um, mindfulness practice when you were working on this book? Did it make you kind of um, take on a particular practice of um, everyday mindfulness at all? Um, yeah, I do kind of um, both pray and meditate in the mornings um, and I was trying to do it on my front porch but then my kid <clears throat> he really likes company I don't know if any of you have got little kids that like to be right next to you whatever you're doing and he eats capsicums as apples so I kept going <laughs> and trying to have a meditative moment and then he'd be like there'd be this capsicum in my ear and he did it every single morning and I'm like he's like no don't mind me <laughs> I won't interrupt it's completely fine um, so I had to kind of like find other capsicum free places around the around the place um, and I found some good spots when I've been walking my dog and um, and also like the swim was like the number one thing because that's that's a very um, that's a very mindful thing and I do now find that when my head like chucks out a whole bunch of stupid thoughts and then I'm just hundred percent there whatever it is on my back or you know the sun on my back or what I, I'm looking at um, it's almost like a lazy way I get to be mine because it does me in a way, but um, that was something I did regularly, yeah. There's, a, there's not a question, but a statement that I have to read to you from um, uh, Ruby, who is eight turning nine in a few weeks. And Ruby oh. wants to um, talk about the cover of your book because it's incredibly pretty and beautiful. Right. Um, when you first had um, saw your book, did you have that experience too of the awe of seeing such a beautiful thing? I was so happy. I love the sparkle in it. The sparkle is amazing. Um, I just love that you can tilt it and get that. Um, Hazel Lamb from Harper Collins is the designer that did this, and um, and I love the insides as well. Although that is, I'm sorry, what was the name of the girl who asked the question? Ruby. Ruby, I love the name Ruby. Ruby, that is a jimble and they are nasty. They're so pretty, but they will sting you and you look like you've got a really bad lip filler situation from Thailand if you get one in the face, which is what happened to me. And some people still have scars, but they're lovely to look at. And that one is actually completely innocuous, so that's fine. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, that's deadly, but also, like, looks cool. But, and yeah, so Elena James, did I just say that, was the... um was the woman who did the who did the drawing behind it that was slightly adapted. And I think the Americans are going to use this cover as well. So they did such a good job. Yeah, it's really pretty. Um, we've got one more question here, which is probably a good point to end on today, which is that in times when people are cut off from others, um, do you um, think that solitary awe and wonder can substitute and compensate for the loneliness that people are feeling and suffering at the moment? So is awe a substitute? for um, solitary or a substitute for that community um, care that you yeah. can Yeah, like not forever, but I, I have found that to be. I think that, honestly, I think the more that you are absorbed in things outside of you, the less likely you are to feel lonely. Um, I mean, we've been able to have a virtual community, so in a way we know what we're... Um, you know, we know that we're not alone in kind of in, in what we're dealing with. And I've really loved seeing a lot of people. Um, you'll see awe and wonder all over the place and the things that people are posting and the way everyone is talking to each other. Um, and in a way, by posting, like, just something really beautiful you've seen, either a dog doing strange things, I still haven't heard about your dog, Emma Kay, or, you know, a beautiful flower or something that someone has seen that day, an extraordinary tree, you're, you're saying I have stopped and wondered about this thing, you know, and I've noticed how much people, I really feel like a lot of people are really paying attention to the world around them at the moment. Um, and that's really the point that I kind of got to at the end of my book about how soothing it can be to get out of yourself. So it's not like, it's not a substitute for actual people, but it's something that can definitely sustain you and give you an immense sense of comfort to be able to stop and and see that see that beauty and like drink in music and you really will be drinking it in like it's a 
with a straw and you, in times like this, haven't you noticed how much we need that the kind of creative output of people around us and what joy that can bring you? So yeah. Fantastic. Look, I've, I've put, um, oh, I just sent it to one person. I've put a link up online for, um, for the book. So if people haven't got the book yet, um, here is the link to go and purchase it after um, the event tonight. You can just hop online and have a bit of a browse. But it's been a really, you know, it's just been such a warm and lovely conversation between you guys tonight. I really enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you, Emma Kate, for doing the questions. And thank you very much, um, Julia, for your input tonight. It was amazing. Thank and we've you. had nothing but a wall of people saying how much they love the book and how much they've enjoyed tonight down here. Oh, I can see people's faces now. Do you know what? I had a quick sneaky look at the beginning of it because I love it when I can see people's faces on this. Mm -hmm. And at first everyone was having their dinner and now everyone's like sitting back on the couch, like so chilled out. Like at first I could see this and now I'm like seeing this of some people. <laughs> June had a really amazing background. It's so nice to see everyone. Thank you for, thank you for joining. Oh, there's a nice glass of wine. We're actually going to, um, I might open the room up in a minute for, um, so people can um, have a clap. So basically I'll unmute everyone. There'll always be someone on the phone though who will um, take, dominate the conversation. But um, I'm going to open the, the room up to chaos now. Okay. So you'll be able to hear people clapping, saying hello. Um, and then I will just have to um, end the meeting because there's no way back from the chaos. But um, was there anything, last thing you wanted to say before I open up to chaos? I do. I want Emma Kate to bring her dog into your room. No. Oh, okay. All right. I'll do mine as well. I'll go and get him. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And yeah, I'm going to grab him. In such a beautiful community that has come, like that I've been in touch with over this book. I've I've loved it. I've loved it so much. I'm going to get my dog. Oh, let's get dogs before we open up. We do want to see the dogs. It's very oh. important. I think I have a very um. I have a cat who tries to get on top of my computer every time I run an event. He's with the cat. Emma Kate, can you um, speak so that we can see your? Can dog? we see? Can we see Zephyr? This is Zephyr. Wait, what kind of dog is this? Come here. Uh, <laughs> Zephyr is. What kind of dog is that? Sit. Good boy. He is an Irish Wolfhound cross oh with God knows what. <laughs> Irish wolf are so great. They're Very so boy. big. Mine's had a haircut, so he looks ridiculous. He used yeah. to be a big shaggy beast. No, he looks <laughs> yeah, I can see him. Can you see him? Yeah, here we are. Who's that? Who's that? He's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Zephyr was um, not surprising. Oh, like there was some other dogs there. Oh. <laughs> Sitting. Elizabeth's got a cute dog. Oh, Elizabeth, your dog's so sweet. And small dog. Just a small one. Yeah, just a decent <laughs> sized one. He's got oh, is that he's left twice left? as big as you were supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Oh, in, there's in another one. Oh, a beautiful retriever with Robin. Yeah. Nice. I'm yeah, I the the room up now, so if you, if you do have dogs, um, yeah. it's time to, to get them out. I'm going to open the room up. And we can yeah. have a look at all your dogs and Love then we'll them. say goodbye. So Thanks, everyone, Julia. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. Put your hands Thanks, in the play. Thanks, yeah. Chrissy. Bye, everyone. Oh, no, no. Open the room up. No, no, no. Don't cancel that. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Unmute. Here we go. Yeah. Hey, Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's another one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful one. Oh, what is that? Is that a brutal? That was a brutal. <laughs> Love the dog. Love the dog. Oh, that's oh, 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 with the dog. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Congratulations. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Oh, this looks really excellent. Joe, <laughs> what is that? Everybody's bringing their dogs in. Oh, is that a brutal? <laughs> yes, I love him. Oh. Yes, I love him. Oh. 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 Oh.
Thanks, everyone. I love the dog show and tell. Oh, and there's a kid. Same thing. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Chrissy.